Matthew chapter number 27. As y'all are turning there, before we can start reading, we got to do a little bit of uh, architecture layout for you. And the Old Testament, okay, but in the wilderness they had the tabernacle, but once Solomon was blessed by God to build Solomon's temple, okay, the layout of the temple very, very different than, you know, what we have nowadays. Okay? Uh, first off, giant rectangle. Okay, so if you're looking at me, rectangle goes this way. Okay, that was known as the wall of the temple, and then inside of that you had what was called the Gentiles' court. Okay, I mean, throughout the scriptures there are many references to those that were not Hebrew who would come to the temple mount to worship God. Well, they had to stay in the Gentiles' court. Okay, then inside of the big rectangle, there's another rectangle that goes this way, facing the opposite direction. Okay, another wall there, and that wall would be what was called the temple ground. Okay, not the temple yet, but it was the temple's ground. And there were gates all throughout this, really wasn't a wall, it was more like what we would call a porch. It had a covering, but there were pillars on it. So you could see through it, but if it was raining, you could stand up underneath of it. Okay, but there were gates throughout that entire porch, if you want to call it that. And there was the women's gate. There was the water gate where they would bring in the water to put in a giant basin to wash the ashes off of the brazen altar. Okay, there was a peace offering gate. Now, all these different gates, you would walk through whichever gate it was that you had reason to be there that day. Okay, then, inside the smaller rectangle, if you were looking at it facing me, in the very bottom part of it, through the main gate, that's what was called the women's area. Okay, women were not allowed to go any further than that under biblical law. Then there was another porch or, you know, set of pillars... Right past that, there was what was called the men's area. Okay? But they couldn't go very far. Okay, that's where if you had an offering, you were allowed to get that close, but then you couldn't go any further. The priest would take the offering from you, and then the priest would handle the offering, whether it was a sacrifice, whether it was a, you know a grain offering unto God, whatever the offering was, the priest would take it from there. And then everything beyond that point to the actual temple, which when we think of temple, we think of building, all this is still open air. Okay, they've got pillars and they've got porch awnings, but it's all open air. But everything from that point forward, you had to be a Levite or a priest in order to step there. Okay, so right after the men's area, or the Israelites area, right in front of that was the great brazen altar. Keep in mind, open air doesn't do much good to set a fire. You know, a giant burning altar inside of a building. Okay? The great brazen altar, and then that great brazen pot that, where they had all the water to wash the ashes off. That was over here on this area. Then this area, this is where they would take the offerings of animals and they'd leave the animals there until the priest was ready to offer it upon the brazen altar. And then, past that, there was like an open courtyard and then there was a set of steps. And that set of steps would take you up to the temple. As we know, it, it was a standalone building that had its own walls, but you couldn't see into the temple from anywhere on the temple mount. Okay, you could see the outside of it, but you couldn't see the inside of it. And there were two great big golden doors. They were wooden doors, but they were overlaid with gold. They had two pillars on each side of them that held up the, what nowadays we'd call the vestibule. And you walked in past those two golden doors. Keep in mind, you'd have to be a Levite to do this. And it would have to be your duty to tend to one of the things inside of the temple. 
Okay, you walked in through those doors and there was a long golden hallway, they say about 60 feet. Okay, so about 20 yards of nothing but everything overlaid in gold. On each side they had five what were called candlesticks. Those were what we nowadays call menorahs. Okay, five huge ones, not little itty bitty ones that you can sit up on the mantle. I'm talking about as big as a man. Ten candlesticks. Okay, then as you went, well, if you're looking, as you went further into the temple, okay, there was the table of showbread. And, I mean, we could go into a whole lesson just on the showbread. But there always had to be showbread, fresh showbread, on the table of showbread in God's house. Then there was the incense table where they were to burn incense unto God. And then at the end of those 60 feet, there was a veil. Not a door, but a veil. Okay, we can go over into Exodus, find where God gave Moses the instructions for it. Okay, but it was a veil that was made out of crimson, blue, and then scarlet. I mean, not crimson. Purple, blue, scarlet. And it had cherubims on it, woven throughout. Okay, and if you go and study out, I mean, it tells them how much material to use when they made this veil. And I'm not a weaver, so I'm not 100%. And I'm not talking about Sydney Weaver. I'm talking about people that weave things. Okay, But I'm not a weaver. But they tell me that if you were to use all of that material to make a veil, the length and the breadth of what God designed, that the width of it, that like the width of this suit coat, very thin. But the width of the veil was about the size of a man's hand. Of solid fabric. And then past the veil was what was called the Holy of Holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant sat. It was approximately 30 feet square. 30 feet this way, 30 feet this way, 30 feet this way, 30 feet this way. In Solomon's temple there were two giant cherubims on each side. And then the Ark of the Covenant sat in the middle of the room. On top of the Ark sat the mercy seat, where once a year, as we heard about on Wednesday night, our preacher teach about that one sacrifice a year of the spotless lamb that would push sins back for a year. That's the only time anybody throughout the entire year was allowed to be past the veil. Every other day of the year, nobody went into the Holy of Holies. Okay? The significance of that room is that's where God resided on earth. Once a year when they would make that sacrifice, God himself would come down and dwell between the cherubims in that room. And there were two cherubims on the Ark of the Covenant too. And God would reside between the cherubims and then the holy Shekinah glory of God would fall. And then that was a sign under the Jews that their sins had been pushed back for a year. Now keep in mind, only one person allowed to go in, but he's only allowed to go in once a year. The rest of the time, that's God's room. Everything in that room was ordered by God to be in that room. Nothing went into that room unless God said to go into that room. The Ark of the Covenant, who gave the instructions for that? God. The mercy seat, who gave the instructions for that? God. The cherubims, who gave the instruction on how those were to be shaped and what they were supposed to look like? God. Even the veil that went around it, who gave the instructions on it? God. Okay, so when people would say, well, I'm going up to the temple, very few people got into the temple. You had to be a Levite to go into the, you know, the 60-foot corridor. They called that the holy place. And then past that was the holy of holies. Only one person ever got to go in there. You could be a priest for your entire life and never see the Ark of the Covenant. So, when they say, I'm going up to the temple, most of the time they were in the outer chambers. Okay, but then, in between the smaller rectangle and where anybody could come in, they had a partition wall. Okay, they tell me it was kind of latticed, 
but it was made out of stone to where you could see through it but it is very clear that there's an obstacle there and all around it there were signs in every language in Greek and Hebrew even in Roman right or Latin those signs said the unclean not allowed to go past here the Gentiles not allowed to go past here and if you do you're going to be killed because in order to go past that wall into what was considered part of the temple you had to be purified even if you were an Israelite if you hadn't purified yourself if you went past that wall and it was found that you were not pure you'd be killed right? Gentiles you could come and see from afar off but you couldn't go past that wall they had a name for it in Hebrew and I don't know how to say it okay but the apostle Paul referred to it as the wall of partition it separated everything about the temple mount everything was ordered to where things were separated on who could go where when they could go there and how they could come there okay so keep that in mind now Matthew chapter number 27 okay we get down here to verse number 50 okay thank you brother Randy Matthew 27 verse number 50 Jesus when he had cried again with a loud voice yielded up the ghost he's on Calvary they're trying to crucify him but he just laid down his own life yielded okay then verse number 51 and behold the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent and the graves were opened and many bodies of saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many so when Jesus was hanging on Calvary and he laid down his life as a sacrifice for sin many things happened to prove that he was the son of God because the Gentiles sought after wisdom but the Jews required a sign well in other accounts we find that before he yielded up the ghost that God darkened the sun in the middle of the day because he didn't want the world to see the shame that had become the son of God having all the sin of man imputed unto him sun stopped shining in the middle of the day that's, that's a weird thing but it said complete darkness that meant the stars and the moon weren't shining either it's not like the sun went out and oh it's nighttime now no everything in heaven light shut off okay then but I say heaven, and the second heaven right first heaven's the sky second heaven's the stars and space third heaven that's where God lives but everything in the second heaven shut off God said one day let there be light that day he said no more light then he says there was a great earthquake this hit in California on the San Andreas Fault the Bible says in the last time that there'd be earthquakes in diverse places earthquakes in Jesus' day that's big news if an earthquake happened it was recorded people took note okay, volcanic eruptions very rare back then why do you think Pompeii was such a big deal an earthquake happened and it says that the rocks rent this wasn't no you know shaking the china in the cabinet jittered a little bit no this this was an earthquake rocks split in half that's how hard the earth shook then verse number 52 said saints that were dead got up out of the grave and then went to the holy city what's that that's jerusalem and they were seeing a many hey y'all know what just happened the son of god just died and when he went in I came out even dead men were testifying of what had just happened and yet the Jews still didn't believe but then a priest went into the temple may have been in there as it happened I don't know but I do know that somebody walked in and realized oh that veil that's about yay thick that it'd be a struggle for me to rip this who 
on earth could have ripped the veil as thick as a man's hand? But then it, it doesn't say sliced. Right? It didn't say cut. It said rent, torn. Not from bottom to top, top to bottom. You study it out, this thing hung up there pretty high in the air. You'd have needed a couple of ladders to get there. And then to get up there, like Brother Ray dangling on a ladder in here trying to change lights, if he could get all the way up to the top, while he was up there trying to balance himself where he was, he'd have to tear that veil. And then tear it all the way down to the bottom. So then, again, it was a sign that God just did something. Because no man could tear that veil. This veil, I don't know if they replaced it or if they did, how many times they had to replace it, but this veil was given in the wilderness. When they had the tabernacle and it was movable, this veil was to be folded up and laid over the Ark of the Covenant when they went and they transported it. The veil served one purpose. To keep those things which were defiled from getting to the thing that God considered holy. That was the mercy seat. That was the Ark of the Covenant. That was God's appointed place where He would reside with Israel. So to keep it from being defiled, this veil was given. It was draped over the Ark every time they moved it. When they did move it, when they set up shop, they would put the ark down first and then the veil would be unfolded. The ark never saw daylight. Right? You wouldn't just be walking past the ark and see, oh hey, I saw a corner of the goat. No, this thing was wrapped up around it good. And the way that they unfolded it, when they, it unfolded out, they didn't take it off of the ark and then set it up. It unfolded out. The ark was always in the middle of the veil. It kept things from defiling what was inside of the veil. It kept people from coming up and approaching what was inside of the veil. It separated what was God's from what was the world. Okay, keep that in mind. So then, flip over with me if you will. Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. In verse number 13. It says, But now in Christ ye who were or ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Well, what's that twain that he's talking about that's made one? the Jew and the Gentile. And he says the thing that kept us from God, the enmity that he talks about in verse number 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. What is that enmity? That's what separated us from God. It kept us from approaching God. What was it? It was sin. Okay, what was the law? Our schoolmaster to show us that we were sinful. Why was the veil necessary? Because outside of the veil was sin. Inside of the veil was God. Even the one time that the priest had to go in there, he had to purify himself thoroughly. One wrinkle in his outfit, and he'd been killed when he went into that holiest of holies. But what separated us from God? Sin. So when Jesus came and fulfilled the law, that meant that through him, all sin could be forgiven. So whether you were Jew or Gentile, it says, if your sin's forgiven, there's no wall of separation. As he said in verse number 14, has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. You know what that was? It was that latticed wall that I talked about before 
on the big rectangle in between big rectangle and the smaller rectangle. Gentiles could come into the temple map, but they couldn't get into the center. There was a wall in the middle that kept them from getting there. He said, he being the Apostle Paul, Jesus tore down that wall. When he laid down his life and got back up, it says in verse number 16 that he may reconcile both unto God in one body. What's that body? The church. Okay, for we are the body, he's the head. Okay? But reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. When he died, the thing that kept us from God died. Sin. Right? No more sin. That means that the thing that separated me from God has been removed. That's why people a lot of times have salvation. Very few have a relationship with God. That's what God desired. Everything that kept us from God, whether you was Hebrew, whether you was Jewish, when Jesus died on the cross, is taken away. Okay, so with the Lord's help this morning, we're going to teach on the veil and the wall. The veil and the wall. Both of them served a similar purpose. The wall was to keep those that were defiled from getting close to the things of God. Because as Gentiles, we didn't have a claim to God. We could do all that we wanted to, but we weren't one of God's chosen people. We could offer up sacrifice for our sins, but that didn't make us one of God's chosen people. There was a way that a Gentile could be adopted into the family of God. Hallelujah. Jesus knew about that. And guess what? We had a kinsman redeemer because in his family tree, there's a Gentile. Right? That's why he could reconcile them all. But, Gentiles, we can't go past that middle wall. That was to keep the defiled thing out. Even an Israelite, if he were defiled, couldn't go past that middle wall of partition. Okay, but then the veil. Even those that were allowed to be in the inner, nobody could go in there unless God said so. You could come offer a sacrifice, whether it was a praise offering, whether it was a sin offering, whether it was, I mean, you go and study it out. After a woman had a child, there was a time of purification, then they went and they would go to the temple and offer praise unto God. There was a sacrifice for when a child was born. Right? Many different types of sacrifice, but you could go and offer that sacrifice whenever you wanted to. What in a specific time that you, well, you can only offer this kind of sacrifice from 9 a.m. until 10 p.m. on this day and these months. No, you could go and worship God freely. But there's one place that you couldn't freely go. That was God's place. That's what the temple was built for. Right? Everything outside was for man. Everything on the inside was to glorify God and to show God that there was a reserved place that nobody else could go into, that nobody else would defile, that that was God's seat inside of Israel to show that they had consecrated, that they had sanctified a place just for God to show that He was their true King. That they didn't need an earthly king, that God was their king. They had the best spot, the prime real estate. Okay, so keeping that in mind, when the veil was rent, when that wall came down, what did that mean? When Jesus tore down the wall of partition, first off it showed that it didn't matter where you came from, all that matters is where you'd been. If you'd been to Calvary, that was good enough for God. The wall of partition was to show that he came into his own and his own received him not. So he tore down the wall so that those that would come, he'd make them into the sons of God. Because whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That he came seeking to save all, that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why the middle wall of partition came down. But then, what's the veil mean? Well, that means now that if the temple were still in effect, if they were still offering up sacrifices, if Jesus just would have broken down that wall, that would have meant the Gentiles could have came 
and made sacrifice and done all that. They would have been accepted with God's people, but that's not where it ends. See, that veil was very important. That veil signified a few things. It separated, as we talked about. On the inside of that veil was the mercy seat. It's where the sacrifice was made. Once a year, the blood of that sacrifice, that spotless lamb, would be sprinkled all around inside of that 30 by 30 room, separated by the veil. And as the blood was applied to the mercy seat in the entire room, if God found the sacrifice please, sin would be pushed back for a year. But that was the only blood that was ever sprinkled in that room. All the other blood was dealt with outside on that brazen altar. Not only one sacrifice a year was to take place inside of that room. But when the veil was rent, God said, I don't need any more sacrifices. It was a testament of the fact that the mercy seat here on earth didn't need it anymore because the one in heaven had had the perfect blood applied to it. In fact, you go and study it out, the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant was modeled after the mercy seat that was in heaven. God gave instructions and said, you're to make one down here because I've got one up there. And really, what it was, if you want to think about it, okay, it was a fax machine. Okay? They would apply the mercy seat and then the blood, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remissions of sin. And God would take the blood applied to the mercy seat and it wasn't a full payment, but He would use it to stave off the sin of Israel for a year. Not because there was anything special about the blood, but because they did according to what He said. They were obedient. They wasn't gone. God still knew all the sin, but it was just pushed back. Well, when God tore the rail, He said, I've got blood on my mercy seat that's better than anything you can offer. In fact, we can go over to the book of Hebrews where it says that we have a high priest that entered once into the holy place and applied his blood, and that priest was Jesus, made our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. My anchor's not within the veil that's down here on earth. It's in the veil that I can't see in heaven. The veil that covers my eyes to where I can't see that Jesus has the blood on the mercy, but I believe that he did. I've got hope anchored in heaven. That there isn't a physical veil in heaven. What's God got to separate himself from up there? He's holy. It's his domain. Everything up there is sinless. Right? The veil is the fact that we can't see it. But even though I can't see it, I've got hope in something that I can't see. That's what that verse is talking about. But this veil is torn. God didn't have any need for it anymore. No more sacrifice because Jesus was the one that was perfect. His blood good enough for everybody from all the way back until all the way until he comes again. Right? God's saying, you don't need the mercy seat anymore. And by this time, they had already lost the Ark of the Covenant. That wasn't even there no more. Right? Where is it? I don't know. Nobody else knows. God knows that's good enough for me. Okay? But, when that veil was rent, something else that it also symbolized, symbolized that God wasn't just going to be in the temple. If you wanted, in Bible days, before Jesus died on the cross, if you wanted to get to the place that you knew where God was, you went to God's house. Because that's where you'd find God. You know? He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Well, those that diligently got to His house, He would reward. There's no guarantee that you'd find Him any other place. In fact, in the wilderness, when God said that He'd go before Him as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, after, I mean, you get into the book of Joshua, after they get into promised land, God said, okay, I delivered you to the place that I told you I was going to be. You don't find that pillar anymore. Where was God at? In the Holy of Holies. In the place that He told them where He would be. You know who would go and commune with God every now and then? The high priest. I think we mentioned it either last week or the week before that. The high priest had that necklace with them two giant gemstones in it. 
and God would speak and those gems would reverberate to where man could audibly hear God's voice and a high priest would come out and tell what God had spoken inside of the temple. If you wanted to find God, you'd go to the veil. You couldn't go in, but you could go outside and plead with God till God spoke. But see, when the veil was rent, God said, I'm not just in the temple anymore. In fact, Jesus said that it was good for him to go away so that the Spirit could come. Why? Because God's found in every newborn believer. We are his tabernacle. He indwells us. Every now and then he shows out around his house. But God's not confined to this. But God wasn't confined to the temple. He's God. But what he says is, you can go other places and find... There, what, there was one temple. They didn't have temples in every Israelite city. There's one. It was in Jerusalem. Right now, you want to find God, God's got a lot of houses. Right? In fact, God indwells every believer. Why do you think he said that if two are gathered together in his name, he'd be in the midst? Because he's already in both of them. He just may show out. Right? The veil showed that God could only be in one place and have a manifest presence. That he would be in the place that he instructed. Well, he made us into new creatures. The entire purpose of him making a new creature is so that we could, one, have fellowship with him, but two, that our spirit would get in line with his spirit. If he indwells all of us, there's no need for a veil. If there was still a veil, we wouldn't have the Holy Ghost. So when the veil was rent, God said, I'm not just going to be here where you have to come to me. I'll go with you. Because he promised he'd never leave us nor forsake us. He promised that we were to take his yoke upon us. What's that mean? He's yoked up with us. Right? But when the veil was rent, it wasn't just a sign that the sacrifice was gone. It wasn't just a sign that God's presence wouldn't just reside in between them cherubims. No, God's presence would be manifest wherever the Holy Ghost was. When the Comforter came, no need for the veil. But see, also, with the veil being rent, just like that wall of partition, it was a sign that God was now approachable to everyone. Anyone could go to God. Not through a priest, which had been the way up until this point. If you wanted a sacrifice made at the temple of God, you didn't get to make the sacrifice. The Levites did it for you. If you had an inquiry that you wanted the priest to take into the Holy of Holies or into the holy place and then pray, hoping that God would speak, you didn't get to go into the temple with him. There was an order that God had outlined. And if you wanted God to honor your request, you would do it according to God's rule book. But when the veil was rent, he's saying, you don't need to be the high priest in order to come to where I am. In fact, after we get saved, He made us a priest, the book of Revelation tells us. That we can enter not into the Holy of Holies, we can enter into the throne room of God in heaven. He said, I'll do you one better. The veil is gone. And your prayers no longer have to go to a mercy seat or an Ark of the Covenant. Your prayers are right before me in heaven. Through prayer, God became approachable. But second, God became approachable not just for anybody but a priest. Any stripe or creed. The wall of partition. You didn't need somebody to say, well, hang on, we have to adopt you into a family and then after that we've got to go through all this ritual. No, no, no. If you want him, you can have him. You didn't have to go through pomp and circumstance. Okay, in order to get saved, you didn't have to go out and purify your flesh and then eat a certain diet for a couple of days. No, you ask God to save you, God saved you. God cut out the middlemen. There was a reason for it in the Old Testament. The Levites were to be given to be holy unto God. 
They weren't to concern themselves with the things of the world. They had one concern. What does God want me to do? And they were to do it as unto God. Right? That was a very respectable thing. They yielded themselves into the service of God. Knowing that other people... You know, the carpenter doesn't have time to go and purify himself and be, you know, like the Levites did. They had a lot of things that they had to do throughout the day. Right? People need sleep, but the Levites were to keep the fire within the candlestick inside of the temple of God all the time. It was never to go out. Right? Well, who do you think made all the oil to go into the lamps? The Levites. In fact, inside of that smaller rectangle that we were talking about, there was a chamber just for oil. They had a whole room stocked full of it at all times. But there was a lot of work that went in to being able to have the presence of God. But when the veil was rent, Jesus did all the work. After I'm saved, all I have to do is be obedient unto Him. Jesus fulfilled all the things that in the Old Testament, they were all symbolic. Right? Pictures of what Christ would fulfill. And when he fulfilled it, that veil was rent. Right? I don't have to put on a certain type of outfit in order to come to the house of God. I should put on my best. Right? Because it's God's house. But there's no qualification of what I can and can't wear, what I can and can't do. Those that worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? Those that come to him, if they come earnestly, God will meet with them. No division, no classification. No high priest. There's one high priest. His name is Jesus. That's good enough for me. Okay, no more sacrifice. No more separation. God is now approachable. But with the tearing of the veil and the coming down of the wall, there also came accountability. See, so used to, I didn't have to worry about making the sacrifice because I knew that the Levites knew how to do it. I just had to be obedient to bring it. Well, when God removed all of the separation and all of the classifications, you know who became responsible for my spirituality? Me. You know, you know who became responsible for offering up my prayers in a way that would be pleasing unto God? Me. You know who became responsible for living a life that would honor God? Me. I can't shuck it off on somebody else. I can't just take a sacrifice to the house of God and say, all right, Lord, why do you think Jesus hated the money changers so much? Because people don't have to work and put in a sacrifice in order to get an animal. They just come up, buy one, and say, okay, here, make my sacrifice for me. And they thought they had done business with God. There was no accountability in that. There was no sincerity in that. But now, who must be sincere? Me. He sincerely fulfilled all those things so that I could approach Him. But now all of the responsibility of being a child of the King rests on my shoulders. That I ought not live like Christ because I fear Him. But because I love Him, I should take on that accountability. Say, Lord, You knew that I could do what I can do. He said He'd take care of the rest. I can do all things through Christ. That means what I can do, I can do, and what I can't do, Christ can do. Greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. That means that all of those responsibilities, all that weight, He said that He'd bear it with me. But work doesn't get done unless you put your shoulder to the plow. Unless you start actually putting one step in front of the, one foot in front of the other, doesn't do you any good that the veil's been taken down. You won't have any fellowship with God. Doesn't do you any good that one sacrifice for sin was given if you keep sinning. Doesn't do you any good to be able to pray unto God if you don't. Doesn't do you any good to know that you can freely read the Word of God and that the Spirit, which wrote the book, will discern the book and explain it to you better than any teacher or any preacher ever could. Doesn't do you any good if you don't apply it. The veil coming, or the veil being rent, the wall coming down, it was the opportunity for man to have a relationship restored with God. Better than the one in the garden. 
Because they'd walk and talk with God in the cool of the day. I walk and talk with them all day long. I can't see him like they saw him. But I can have fellowship every second of every day. That's something Adam and Eve didn't have. And one day, it's going to be real good. But even now, everything that God put out on the platter and said, everything's been fulfilled, Christ did it, everything that once separated you from God is gone. All you have to do is accept salvation and then accept the responsibility of being a child of the King. A lot of people don't like accountability. A lot of people don't like responsibility. They like to think that they can keep God in a little room somewhere. God was never in that room. But God promised that He would reside in that room with Israel if they were obedient. But God said that He will reside in every second of your daily life if you're just obedient to follow after Him. He said if you love Me, you'd keep His commandments. He said that if we love Him, we'd have a love for sinners. We'd have a love for the gospel to get the work that Christ started to where God wants it to be till it's finished. That if we love Him, we'll lay up our treasures in heaven because that's where our heart is. The thing the most dear to us is the place that we headed to, home, not where we're at right now. That takes work. takes accountability, but if you don't accept it, you may be saved, but they had their sins pushed back every year. They didn't have to do it. My sins are gone, but unless I accept the responsibility, I don't get any of the perks. I won't have His presence. I won't have a touch of God on my life. I won't know the will of God, and I won't do the will of God. And if I'm a child of the King, those that are disobedient, He chastens because He loves them. And be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you're obedient, you'll reap fruit. Because he instructed you to be fruitful and to bear much fruit. But if you reap whatever you desire, and there's no accountability, there's no responsibility, there's no love for what God took away when the veil was rent, when the wall came down, if we don't appreciate it, we trample the very blood of Jesus Christ under our feet. Because it took that blood to take those things down so that we could approach God today. That we could come and say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. That we could come and sing praise unto Him in a place that He ordained was His house. Because if the temple was still up, this would just be a building. If the veil was never rent, we could sing and we could pray, but we weren't one of God's. I'm glad that the veil was rent, that the wall came down, and that he said that if I'd accept, that if he stood at the door and knocked, that if he opened, he'd come in and he'd sup with them. I'm glad he sups with me. I'm glad he's my friend. More importantly, I'm glad he's my father. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.